Okay, well, hi everyone. My name is Jennifer Walsh. I'm a senior media officer with the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I'd like to welcome you all this morning for joining us for the public briefing uh, to release our new report, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare. Uh, this report is now available to the public, and you can download it for free along with uh, multiple other resources about the report uh, at nas.edu forward slash improving diagnosis. Again, that's nas.edu forward slash improving diagnosis. And I should say there's no www before that. Uh, so this will be a one hour briefing unless we run out of questions beforehand. We will start off with some opening remarks to introduce the study and then give an overview of the report's findings and recommendations. We will then open the floor up to questions for those who are attending in person and those via the web. Uh, when it is time for those of you in the room to ask a question, we ask that if you can please go to the microphone to ask your question. There's two here in the room. And those of you watching the webcast can ask a question by typing in uh, a question in the Q&A box, which is below the video feed. Um, so just type in a question into the text box and click the submission button. And due to the limited time for this briefing, we're uh, gonna only be taking questions only for the briefing. Lastly, I ask that anybody, anybody who asks a question to please identify themselves and their organizations. Now with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Victor Zhao, President of the National Academy of Medicine. Well, good morning and welcome. I, uh, as you know, I'm the president of the National Academy of Medicine, and I'm also a physician. And the last 10 years, I was also running a health system, so you can imagine how important this report is as a physician, as someone who oversees care delivery. It is really a really important, critical part of healthcare, a central premise, in my opinion, of any health plan, local or national, is to provide quality of care. And the IOM has an unwavering, an unwavering commitment and a rich history in quality and safety. 15 years ago, the IOM released two landmark reports to Air is Human, Building a Safer Health System, which dramatically exposed the issue of patient safety in healthcare, and of course, crossing the quality chasm, a new health report for the 21st century which call for fundamental changes to the healthcare system. You know, the Aries Human was a wake-up call. It provided startling statistics that as many as 100,000 Americans die in hospitals every year due to medical errors. Quality Chasm sought to close the healthcare quality gap in America to find six high-quality uh, aims, which is safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficacy, and equity. These landmark reports from IOM reverberated throughout the healthcare community and were the impetus for system-wide improvement in patient safety and quality. I can tell you personally, as I'm sure my colleagues on the panel can tell you, uh, how important it has been, not only to US healthcare, but healthcare globally that truly has transformed healthcare. These efforts that were initiated by IOM reports have clearly paid off. This past December, the Department of Health and Human Services re released a report that showed a 17% decline in hospital-acquired conditions from 2010 to 2013. This translates to 1.3 million fewer patient harms, 50,000 lives saved, and $12 billion in health spending avoided. So you can see we've come a long way. But the critical element that's largely been absent from patient safety and quality movement is diagnostic error. This latest report, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, is a serious second wake-up call in my mind that, still, that we still have a long way to go. Diagnostic errors are a significant contributor to patient harm and has received far too little attention until now. Diagnosis is fundamental to the delivery of high quality care. Diagnosis explains a patient's health problem and it sets the stage for subsequent decisions around the care of the patient. 
errors in diagnosis, inaccurate or delayed, can persist throughout all settings of care and continue to harm, in my mind, an unacceptable number of patients. So you hear from today's report that actually most of us, people in this room, will experience a diagnostic error in our lifetime, sometimes with devastating consequences. So despite the pervasiveness of diagnostic error and the risk for patient harm, they have been largely unappreciated within the quality and patient, patient safety movements in healthcare. This cannot and must not continue. Now, to address this challenge of diagnostic error, the IOM undertook this study at the request of Society of, to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. Ten sponsors supported this, and I am, I am convened a 21-member committee to analyze the problem of diagnostic error and propose actionable solutions. The sponsors include the Agency for Health Care Research and Quality, the American College of Radiology, American Society for, uh, for Clinical Pathology, Cautious Patient Foundation, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, College of American Pathologists, the Doctors' Company Foundation, Janet and Barry Lang, Kaiser Permanente National Benefit Community Benefit Fund at the East Bay Community Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. You can see everybody gets it. It's a really important issue. Now, we're very lucky to have a great committee. Uh, six of them are here, chaired by John Ball, who is with us today. Thank you, John. And of course, the other members include Bob Berenson, Chris Castle, who in fact was very involved with this area, even the very beginning of the previous report, Mark Graber, uh, Beth McLean, and of course, George Tebow. The committee was supported by a great team of IOM staff, including Erin Barlow, uh, Sharon Ness, Brian Miller, Selim Balabat, and Patrick Ross. I really like to thank this great work of the committee and the staff for their really outstanding effort and work. They spent long hours on this topic, not an easy one you can imagine. I think this committee and staff team produced to me one of the most comprehensive uh, reports on this topic and it captures the challenges and complexity of diagnosis in the healthcare system. You'll hear from John Ball in a few minutes, committee was given a very broad statement of task, which included exam examining epidemiology, burden of harm, cost associated with diagnostic error, as well as current efforts to improve diagnosis. And they proposed solutions, which you'll hear from them. I'm confident that improving diagnosis in healthcare, like the early reports of the IOM series, will have a profound effect not only uh, on the way healthcare system operates, but also on the lives of our patients. And this report must be translated to action. Indeed, NAM and IOM realize that we must do a lot more to increase our impact. So this December, the National Academy of Medicine will hold an event to observe the 15 years of the anniversary of the original report. The Richard Hinder Rosendahl Symposium will highlight the impact of the IOM reports, but also address shortcomings of the report, and of course inc incorporate some of the findings from this report and identify future priorities. So we hope all of you will come to this very exciting 15-year anniversary of the initial series. And of course, more information about the event will be posted on the website at NAM in coming weeks. So I don't want to take any of your time because I think time is short and this is such an important report. I just want to thank the committee again for a job well done. This means so much to our patients, to our nation, and to me. Thank you. So if I can ask um, John Ball to come up and uh, give us the findings report. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Um, of all the committee reports with which I've been associated, this is the first time that the president of the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, has introduced the report as we open, as we present it to the public. So I want to thank you very much for that. 
that indicates the importance, I think, that the National Academy of Medicine places on this particular issue as part of the Crossing the Quality Chasm uh, Quality Series that the Institute of Medicine instituted back in 2000. Uh, as, as Dr. Zhao points out, it was 15 years ago that To Urge Human uh, was produced, shortly followed by Crossing the Qual Quality Chasm. Uh, stating the obvious in To Urge Human, that human beings make errors, but highlighting the, rare, the theretofore rarely discussed issue that we in healthcare also make errors, the report began a quiet revolution in the way in which safety and quality is addressed uh, in our healthcare organizations. Although both reports mentioned diagnostic error as an issue, neither devoted much space or substantial analysis to the issue or made recommendations having to do with diagnostic error. Surprisingly, too, there has been little attention paid to the issue in the interim. It was because of this lack of attention that some 10 organizations asked us to sponsor uh, the study at the Institute of Medicine, and Dr. Zhao has called those out, but I want to once again recognize the sponsors without which this study could not have taken place. The Institute of Medicine put together a committee of 21 people, of whom you see six of us here, uh, and you'll hear from the other five on the panel in, in just a little bit as we go through some of the details of the study. The charge to the study was broad, and one of the uh, things that the Institute of Medicine committees have to do is meet the charge, the whole charge, and nothing but the charge. Otherwise, we don't get it through the review process, which is a very stringent, and in this case, really helped report as we moved forward. So what are the key themes of the report? Three basic key themes of the report in the committee's view. First, improving diagnosis in healthcare exposes a critical error, diagnostic error, that has received insufficient attention. There are several reasons why diagnostic error has been underappreciated, even though the correct diagnosis is a critical aspect of healthcare. First, the data on diagnostic error are sparse. Second, few reliable measures exist and third, often the error is identified only in retrospect. Yet the best estimates, as Dr. Zhao has pointed out, the best estimates indicate that all of us will likely experience a meaningful diagnostic error in our lifetime. Perhaps the most important contribution of this report is to highlight the importance of this issue and to direct discussion among patients and healthcare professionals and organizations of what might be done about it. Second, patients are central to the solution. The report defines diagnostic error from the patient's viewpoint as the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health care problem and to communicate that explanation to the patient. The report's first goal centers on the need to establish partnerships with patients and their families to improve diagnosis, and several recommendations address this goal. Third, diagnosis is a collaborative effort. The stereotype of a single physician contemplating a patient's presentation and discerning the diagnosis is not always true. The diagnostic process often involves intra- and interprofessional teamwork, nor is, diagnosis, or nor is diagnostic error always due to human error. It often occurs because of errors in the healthcare system. The complexity of health and disease and the increasing complexity of healthcare demands collaboration among and between healthcare professionals as well as with patients and their families. In addition to these three major themes, the report, highlight, the report highlights several key issues that must be addressed if diagnostic errors are to be reduced. Healthcare professional education and training does not take fully into account advances in the learning sciences. The report emphasizes training in clinical reasoning, teamwork, and communication. Health information technology, while potentially a boon to healthcare quality, is often a barrier to effective clinical care in its current form. The report makes several, several recommendations to improve the utility of health information technology in the diagnostic process specifically and the clinical process generally. There are a few data on diagnostic error. The report recommends, in addition to specified research, the development of processes to monitor the diagnostic process and to identify, learn from, and reduce diagnostic error. The healthcare work system and culture do not sufficiently support the diagnostic process. Echoing previous Institute of Medicine work, 
The report also recommends the development of an organizational culture that values open discussion and feedback on diagnostic performance. And the report finally highlights the increasingly important role of radiologists and pathologists as members of the diagnostic team. <coughs> there were also areas where the committee wished that it could go further, but found that there are insufficient data currently to support strong recommendations. And if we didn't have the data support strong recommendations, it wouldn't make it through the review process. Dr. Zhao is nodding. One of those areas is the payment system, now evolving from fee-for-service to more value and population-based. Research on the efforts of novel payment systems on diagnosis is needed. Another area is that of medical liability. The report recommends the adoption of communication and resolution programs as a key lever to improve the disclosure of diagnostic errors to patients and to facilitate improved organizational learning from these events. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And a final area of potential controversy is the measurement of diagnostic errors for public reporting and accountability purposes. The committee believed that, given the lack of agreement on what constitutes a diagnostic error, given the paucity of hard data, and the lack of valid measurement approaches, the time was simply not ripe to call for mandatory reporting. Instead, it was appropriate at this time to leverage the intrinsic motivation of healthcare professionals to improve the diagnostic performance and to treat diagnostic error in the same way we treat other quality improvement efforts by healthcare organizations. Well, what were some of our findings? Getting the right diagnosis is a key aspect of healthcare. It provides an explanation of the patient's health problem first and informs healthcare treatment decisions. However, diagnostic errors persist through all settings of care and do harm an unacceptable number of patients. In every research area we looked, whether it was health services research, medical chart review, autopsy review, patient surveys, physician surveys, diagnostic errors were consistent quality and safety standard. And the bottom line, as Dr. Zhao points out, it's likely that most of us would experience at least one diagnostic error in a lifetime of meaningful circumstance. The committee then developed a conceptual model of what uh, diagnostic error was. First, we defined diagnostic error, which again is the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problems or to communicate that explanation to the patient. Three elements, accuracy, timeliness, and communication to the patient. This is a patient-centric diagnosis, our, our definition of diagnostic error. We came up with a conceptual framework of the diagnostic process that begins with the patient understanding that they have a problem that they need to come into the health system and leads to the outcome. But it's an iterative process. It's not simply a linear process, and at each point there's feedback into it. And we go into several, in cha several chapters the exposition of the diagnostic process. And finally, the diagnostic process occurs within a work system. It is not the workings of a single health caregiver's mind. Uh, there's the diagnostic team members that include patients, the clinician, and other health caregivers. There are certain tasks that those people perform. They operate within an organization by and large. They're the effects of the physical environment on the one hand and of technologies and tools that they use in the process. So diagnosis is not a simple linear process. It is complex. You'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. <coughs> this slide simply indicates that, in, that patients are central to the diagnostic team. Patients and their families first, diagnosticians second, and those who support the diagnostic process third. Our final conclusion was that it's very important both to focus on diagnostic error and the reduction of diagnostic error, but also to focus on improving diagnosis. So the recommendations go to both of those areas, not merely the reduction of error, but also the improvement of the diagnostic process. We came up with eight goals to improve diagnosis and reduce diagnostic error. Each of these goals is followed by a set of recommendations. And I'll walk you through the recommendations as they track with these particular goals. Recommendation one. And this tracks the goal of facilitate more effective teamwork in the, in the diagnostic process among healthcare professionals, patients, and their families. The first recommendation is addressed to healthcare organizations and says they should ensure that healthcare professionals have the appropriate knowledge, skills, resources, and support 
to engage in teamwork in the diagnostic process, which includes both inter- and intra-professional teamwork and collaboration among pathologists, radiologists, and, and treating healthcare professionals to improve diagnostic testing. Healthcare professionals should also partner with patients and their families and create environments where patients and their families can learn about and engage in the diagnostic process and share feedback in, and concerns to ensure that patients have access to electronic health records, including their clinical notes and diagnostic testing results, and to include patients and their families in efforts to improve the diagnostic process. Recommendation two, which tracks with the goal of enhancing healthcare professional education and training. Educators should ensure that curricular and training programs across the career address performance in the diagnostic process and include evidence from the healthcare uh, from the learning sciences. You'll hear more about this in a bit, which includes education and training in clinical reasoning, teamwork, communication, diagnostic testing, and health IT. Certification and accreditation organizations should ensure that healthcare professionals have competence and maintain the competence in these particular areas. Recommendation three, which tracks with the goal of ensuring that healthcare technology and healthcare health information technologies support patients and healthcare professionals in the diagnostic process. Um, this is an area where we heard both from physicians and from patients is in real need of help. Health IT vendors and the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT should work together to, with users to ensure that health IT used in the diagnostic process demonstrates usability, uh, incorporates human factors knowledge, provides clinical decision report, and fits well within the clinical workflow. Health IT, we found, supports more billing and documentation and legal issues rather than the clinical process or the diagnostic process. And these recommendations go to attempting to improve health IT and its effect on the diagnostic process. Recommendation four, which tracks with the goal of develop approaches to identify, learn from, and reduce diagnostic errors and near misses in clinical practice. Accreditation organizations and Medicare through its conditions of participation should require that healthcare organizations monitor the diagnostic process, identify, learn from, and reduce diagnostic errors and near misses, and provide systematic feedback on diagnostic performance to healthcare professionals and others. HHS also should, because autopsy has fallen off, the, the prevalence of autopsies have fallen off tremendously in the last 20 years, HHS should find a way to fund a select group of healthcare organizations so that we really can find, through this gold standard, what the prevalence of diagnostic error are. And healthcare professional societies, much as they've done under the Choosing Wisely campaign, should identify opportunities to improve accurate and timely diagnoses and reduce diagnostic errors in their specialties. Recommendation five, which tracks with the goal of establishing a work system and culture that supports the diagnostic process. Healthcare organizations should promote a non-punitive culture that values open discussion and feedback on diagnostic performance. This tracks with many of the Institute of Medicine's reports over the last 15 years. Should design work systems that support patients, their families, and health professions, professionals in the diagnostic process, and ensure effective and timely communication between diagnostic testing professionals, largely radiologists and pathologists, and the treating care, care professionals across the healthcare system. Recommendation six, which tracks with the goal of developing a reporting environment and medical liability system that facilitates improved diagnosis and learning. Uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and others should encourage and facilitate the voluntary reporting of diagnostic errors, and ARC should evaluate the effectiveness of patient safety organizations as a major mechanism for volunteer reporting. States should also promote a legal environment that facilitates timely identification, disclosure, and learning from diagnostic errors. Adoption of communication and resolution programs, demonstration projects with alternative approaches to the resolution of measure medical injuries, and professional liability insurers should collaborate with healthcare professionals to improve diagnosis through education, training, and practice development. Recommendation seven, which tracks with the goal of design a payment and care delivery environment that supports the diagnostic process. CMS and other payers should provide coverage 
for evaluation and management activities, including time spent by pathologists, radiologists, and others in advising clinicians on diagnostic testing. With some 30,000 tests, 10,000 of which are molecular diagnostic tests, no single tr treating physician can ever know what test, to, what test to use in specific circumstances, and the collaboration will help both find the appropriate test and decrease the cost of testing. Without that, then there's going to be a shotgun approach to testing. CMS should also reorient relative value fees to more appropriately value the time spent with patients in EMM activities. This also reflects previous Institute of Medicine reports. And CMS should modify the documentation guidelines to improve accuracy of information in the electronic health record. And finally, to assess the impact of payment and care delivery models on the diagnostic process and diagnostic error. And finally, Recommendation 8, which tracks with the goal of providing dedicated funding for research, often a set of recommendation in, internal, in, in IOM reports, and necessary in this case because we simply don't know the, the scope of diagnostic error. Um, that federal agencies should develop a coordinated, coordinated research agenda on diagnostic process and di diagnostic errors, should commit dedicated funding for the implementation, and that the government should pursue and encourage opportunities for public-private partnerships, including such organizations as PCORI, the foundations, diagnostic testing, and health IT institutions, healthcare associate organizations, and professional liability insurers. In the end, improving the diagnostic process is not only possible, we believe, but it does represent a moral, professional, and public health imperative. Achieving the goal will require a significant re-envisioning of the diagnostic process and widespread commitment to change. Uh, when on the website will be uh, resources for patients. We also have hard copy for resources to patients of how they, as a central actor within the diagnostic process, can get more involved to the extent that their values and their education and their interest uh, allows them to be involved. Uh, now let me turn over um, the, not the podium, but the table to each member of the, uh, of the committee to talk about specific areas to explicate what I've said. Okay. Um, thank you, John. I think I'm next. Um, I want to uh, use my time to um, talk about the role of the physician and physician-specific aspects. Um, you correctly pointed out this is not just about really smart doctors sitting alone in a room trying to figure out a tough problem. Um, but, and we're going to hear more about the team um, aspects of this from other um, speakers on the panel. But I'm, I'm, I do want to focus on the fact that there are things that we in medicine and in medical education need to think about in order to help the physician do his or her part more effectively in service of getting the patient the diagnosis and the communication that they need. So just a couple of areas I want to highlight uh, from what you said. One has to do with education and training. We need to actually teach much more explicitly an awareness of cognitive patterns. It's important for doctors not only to memorize and know a lot of information, but they also need to understand how they think and how thinking patterns can be pulled off track by distractions or time pressures, uh, assumptions. Even recent experiences can color your thinking so that you miss important cues in the diagnosis. So the more awareness of this uh, physicians have, the more likely they are to be open to questioning whether they're proceeding with the right diagnostic assumptions. That same explicit awareness needs to be built into continuing education and to certification standards throughout the physician's um, uh, career. The second um, point related to physician training and throughout the uh, career of, of physicians is to teach expectations of teamwork. We have, in many of our reports on quality and safety of healthcare, we've emphasized that it's not a doctor alone, but it's a doctor as part of a system of other providers, information systems, and um, ways of doing things that can constantly be improved if you look at healthcare as a system. So the expectations here related specifically to diagnosis 
really call for major culture change in how we think about the role of the physician. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. In order to be open to questioning your thinking, you need to be welcoming of the patient questioning what you're thinking. Doctor, are you sure that's what you think I have? What about this other symptom? Leaving time, asking questions in the interaction. Also, open-mindedness to hearing from other members of the healthcare team, the, the nurse, the social worker, the pharmacist, the physical therapist, who might have observations that would be relevant to saying, you know, maybe this problem that you're having could be something else. And then finally, in order to have a truly learning healthcare system, another important report in this series from the Institute of Medicine, um, Physicians need to be open to feedback from their colleagues, from other physicians, so that if a patient goes on a diagnostic odyssey searching for an answer to a question that's not being answered, and they go from one doctor to the next, and a doctor and a team finally do make the right diagnosis, it should be the norm that that physician would pick up the phone and call the other physician and say, you know what, it turned out this patient had X and not Y. Now it would be considered embarrassing and sort of like challenging the person's professionalism to do that. We think it should be exactly a standard of professionalism that every physician should consider that kind of feedback their responsibility and that physicians should be open to getting that kind of feedback because of course that's the only way we can really learn from, um, from being part of this feedback process. So let me stop there and turn this over to George. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm approaching this from the standpoint of an educator in the health professions. And I'll reinforce some of the points that Chris made, but thinking it more broadly of not just physician education, but the education of all health professionals. And there are three points I want to make. The critical thinking in understanding the common causes of cognitive errors can be and should be taught to all health professionals, particularly physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants who will be in a primary diagnostic role and who will work in the diagnostic process. So that's point number one. The second point, since we've already heard, and it's a very important message to reinforce, and I think it's one of the revelations of this report, is that diagnose, diagnose, Diagnosis is a team process. Therefore, interprofessional and interdisciplinary education are an essential part of the education of all health professionals. So they will learn to work in teams and they will appreciate the contribution of all other team members. With that comes the responsibility to communicate effectively within the team and with patients. That's an essential part of the educational process of all health professionals that we believe will lead to an improvement in the diagnostic process. The third essential educational point is that as we have learned with treatment errors over the last two decades, diagnostic errors can be and should be thought of as a system problem. And the more we learn about the key features, the settings in which diagnostic error occur, the epidemiology of diagnostic error, and the system's approach to diagnostic errors, that feedback to the system leads to true education within the system, as Chris referred to, the learning healthcare system. So all three of these messages, we can teach cognitive learning and critical thinking, we can teach teamwork, communication and the appreciation of the role of others, and we can teach the system to improve by constant feedback. These are all positive messages in their very achievable goals. I'll pick up from George. Um, as you've heard, we can't uh, routinely measure diagnostic accuracy. What we know about the significant rates of errors comes from targeted research. That reality then makes it important that we, that there be a robust voluntary reporting of errors that cause harm and near misses so that we can, in effect, create a database to analyze and learn. 
Based on recommendations from Two Errors Human, Congress in 2005 conferred privilege and confidentiality protections to healthcare organizations that share specified patient safety information with federally listed patient safety organizations is what they're called. However, progress in implementing the PSO program has been slow. The committee recommends that ARC uh, should evaluate the effectiveness of PSOs as the major mechanism for voluntary reporting and learning from uh, those events related to diagnostic error. And that ARC should modify the PSO common formats for reporting for patient safety events to include diagnostic errors and near misses. The need for a blame-free environment brings up the issue of medical malpractice. The report documents that misdiagnosis and delayed diagnosis are leading causes of suits and liability payouts. Indeed, we recognize some malpractice carriers for their exemplary programs for educating health professionals on how to improve diagnostic performance, and, and we urge greater collaboration between these organizations and others uh, on methods and materials for educating clinicians. Further, we recommend funding demonstrations of fundamental, fundamentally different approaches to addressing medical error that produces harm, uh, uh, such as healthcare courts that would take malpractice out of the adversarial court environment to a blame-free environment that also provides injured patients earlier insurer compensation than now. Uh, we really haven't performed this kind of research. On payment, there are lots of hypotheses, but virtually no evidence on the effect of different payment approaches on diagnostic accuracy. With all the demos going on around payment and delivery system reforms, medical homes, accountable care organizations, bundled payment, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the impact on diagnosis and diagnostic accuracy should be one of the markers of outcomes that at least some of the evaluators are asked to assess. So far, that is not one of the endpoints that are, are part of that research, and it should be. In the meantime, uh, while we're working on new payment models, we, have, we pay physicians on fee schedules. Um, and the report makes a number of concrete recommendations on improvements in that area. I would be happy to address some of those specific recommendations in the Q's and A's. Mark, it's yours. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to reemphasize what the report means for patients. We will all be patients someday. The committee heard stories of patients who experienced diagnostic error during our deliberations, and you'll see some of those stories in just a minute. So this report is about patients. It's for patients, and it places patients right at the center of the diagnostic process. The committee recognized that by including patients in the definition of diagnostic error, the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problems or communicate that explanation to the patient. The committee reviewed evidence that engaged patients have better outcomes and the report goes on to create new opportunities for improved patient engagement by making them the key partner in the diagnostic process. This was captured in recommendation 1B, so this is the first and possibly the most important recommendation in the report. We are looking for patients to understand the diagnostic process, to participate in it, to act as a safety net for errors, and to be part of the feedback system so we can improve calibration and diagnostic performance. As a health services researcher who's focused on measuring quality of care, I would like to make three points today related to the need for measurement and research. First, measurement is essential. The committee, as you've heard, concluded that almost everyone will experience a diagnostic error in their lifetime, sometimes with devastating consequences. However, the committee was unable to construct a population-based estimate of the magnitude of the problem. We reviewed really excellent research that made it clear that the problem of diagnostic errors is very real and warrants our attention. But the existing studies are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Those studies allowed us to see the landscape, but we couldn't put the pieces together to form a single reliable number. The most promising sources of estimates that we looked at are autopsies, reviews of medical records, and analyses of medical malpractice claims. 
All of these approaches have in common that an adverse event, an unexplained death, an unexplained utilization of healthcare resources, a diagnosis, a malpractice claim, triggered a review that led to a conclusion about the presence of a diagnostic error. But we just don't know how representative the cases that do get reviewed are compared to the general set of diagnostic opportunities. So the report presents our recommendations for ways to improve our ability to make estimates and to understand the nature and magnitude of the problem. Second, we need an all-in approach to measuring diagnostic error. The diagnostic process, as you've heard, is complex. It can start anywhere, and there are multiple paths that can be taken along the journey, or odyssey, as Chris called it. No one data source, method, setting, or circumstance will be sufficient to enable us to understand the multiple causes and risks of diagnostic error. So we need to be measuring those pathways and journeys everywhere they're happening. An important contribution of the committee's work is making explicit that we need to focus on the work systems in which the diagnostic process occurs. Work systems are local. When you've seen one, you've seen one. This is why the committee recommends that all healthcare organizations monitor the diagnostic process for assessment, learning, and improvement. We've learned multiple times that you really can't fix something if you can't measure it, and you won't know if you're making progress if you don't measure it. Third, investments in research and learning are necessary to enable progress. Given the nascent state of research on diagnostic error and the need for better tools, the committee recommends that the federal government develop a coordinated research strategy and secure dedicated funds to implement that strategy. The committee also recommends public-private partnerships in both research and learning. The gaps in knowledge that the committee identified through its deliberative process make clear how much we still need to learn particularly about the strategies that are most effective in improving the diagnostic process, preventing errors, and intervening rapidly to mitigate their harm when they do occur. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of my fellow committee members, but particularly the ones on uh, the panel here for their comments and for their work on the project. Um, we're about to see a, a very short video, again, about diagnostic error from the patient's perspective. All three of these vignettes illustrate one particular issue in the diagnostic process, which is communication and the importance of communication among the members of the healthcare team with patients and their families. That obviously is not the single issue in diagnostic error, but we wanted to illustrate that issue for this audience. Let's go to the video if we could. started really early when out of the blue I had this pain down my left arm. I remember reading or hearing something about pain in your arm could be a heart attack. I decided I better get myself checked out in the emergency room. The medical staff in the ER snapped to attention. I explained my symptoms. Immediately they ordered the standard cardiac test. All of my tests came back normal. The doctor said to me quite clearly, you are in the right demographic for acid reflux. And my first reaction was embarrassment that I had just wasted five hours of their very valuable time. But even I knew that pain down your left arm is not a sign of indigestion. And I'd asked the doctor about that. The nurse in the ER warned me quite sternly that I should stop asking questions of the doctor. She said he was a very good doctor and he does not like to be questioned. And so I was sent home from the ER in the middle of a heart attack. Over the next two weeks, my symptoms continued and I didn't want to go back to the emergency room and be embarrassed again. I thought the kind of care that I might get would be affected if they saw me as a difficult patient. But I knew something was terribly wrong. The second time that I arrived at the ER, I had an emergency procedure to unblock a 95% blockage of my heart. Since my heart attack, I have ongoing cardiac issues. I had to stop working. Had I been diagnosed correctly the first visit, my outcomes would have been uh, far better than they turned out to be.
my son Cal entered the world about two and a half weeks early. To hold your first child, your firstborn is really very, um, it's very powerful. But the first day they noticed that he was turning yellow, we were told that he was jaundice and not to worry about it. We were discharged with a well baby. Three hour naps went to four hour naps and then they went to five hour naps. He was still yellow, he was getting kind of floppy. My husband and I took Cal to the pediatrician and whenever I brought up a concern, a worry, or a symptom, I was always told that I was overreacting. He didn't get better. So when we took him to the hospital, a resident actually admitted Cal and he documented that Cal's blood type was the same as mine. Actually, Cal's blood type was A and I was O. So that document error had a significant impact on how they were treating Cal. Cal's bilirubin was the highest level they'd ever seen in the hospital. This toxin was building up in Cal's bloodstream. His legs were trembling. He would stop breathing when he was sleeping. He couldn't breastfeed at all. We were really told not to worry. Babies do funny things. I was reporting very classic symptoms of the onset of brain damage with jaundice. Nobody took me seriously. 16 months later, he was finally diagnosed by a clinical team in another state. The MRI clearly indicated they had suffered brain damage from his newborn jaundice. Cal is um, now 20. He has significant cerebral palsy. He can walk independently with a walker. His speech is very impaired. He's a smart brain trapped in a body that, that doesn't work. first time I felt anything different was in the car ride on the way home from work that day. I felt like I got hit in the chest with a sledgehammer. When I walked into the ER, I presented myself as having a heart attack, and they immediately took me back in. The emergency room doctor had come in and did the initial diagnosis of a heart attack. My wife arrived at the hospital 15, 20 minutes after I arrived. She was the first one other than myself to notice that my, my leg was swelling and that my foot had started to, to go prone. And that caused them to further investigate what was happening. <laughs> In a matter of minutes, I was being operated on. They had diagnosed me with a AAA aortic dissection. That's when the inner layer of the aorta disconnects from the outer layer and restricts blood flow. With this condition, very few people walk away. Very, very few. The critical thing that the medical staff did was listen. Even though the initial diagnosis was a heart attack, we didn't take that as the final word. My recovery has been a fascinating journey. Some days are better than others, but it's great to be alive. I'm very thankful that the diagnostic team and the surgical team were working hand in hand with each other through the whole process. I'm looking forward to retirement and enjoying my family and my grandkids, which I wouldn't have that opportunity if we hadn't spoke out. One of the things that uh, I've learned through this experience is that no diagnosis is complete until it's complete. You know your body. You know when something's not right. That teamwork, though, it's, it's um, something that uh, we all need to strive for because I believe you will have better outcomes, you will have better communication, just overall better care. The communication is the key. Now open it up to questions. So if anybody in the room wants to ask a question, I ask if you can please go to a microphone. Um, but while we do that, we have gotten a couple web questions in, so I want to throw the first question out to the committee. This is from Ron Mott from NBC News. He asks, with respect to improving workplace culture and systems, what evidence did the committee find that time pressures, meaning how much time medical personnel spend collaborating with patients, contribute to the rate of diagnostic errors? In other words, are doctors and other health providers simply not spending enough time listening to patients? 
Thank you, John. I'll uh, answer that. Others may have observations. We did have one of our um, uh, members, Pat Crosbury, who is an expert at this issue of the environmental influences and how they affect critical thinking and the analytical function. Um, and he indeed uh, has done research and showed us other research showing that things like time pressures, things like fatigue, things like um, uh, external distractions, um, all can contribute not just in the diagnostic process, but in anything we do in life with um, uh, having us miss cues and not giving the time to the uh, careful um, thinking. And of course, a big part of that time is what we heard in the video is the patient's the need to welcome the patient into the process and have the family member who noticed something or asked their questions and take those questions more seriously. And if I could just quickly uh, jump in. Um, in looking at payment, uh, we have a strong recommendation that the current uh, fee schedule, which is based on relative values of, uh, of, how, of the resource costs associated with different physician activities, undervalues the time spent with patients uh, while there's suggestions that it pays much more generously for, for procedures and tests. So we have a recommendation to increase the relative uh, payment for time spent between uh, clinicians and patients. I'm Peggy Eastman with Oncology Times newspaper. Um, earlier this year, President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, and I'm wondering to what extent you believe that this will help uh, improve faulty diagnosis since the whole purpose of it is to base a diagnosis on molecular um, factors, uh, possibly genetic mutations, which then inform the treatment. So uh, certainly improved testing is going to improve the diagnostic process and the greater precision of testing that's available will help with that. But it also adds to the complexity of the process and points out the importance of interdependability of the healthcare team. Uh, no single physician is going to know everything about all of these new molecular tests. And that's where teamwork is going to be important both for selection of the appropriate tests and interpretation of them. Also, we need to realize that even though we've made incredible progress in understanding diseases at the molecular level, many of the things that we're faced with clinically are not understood at the molecular level. They're much more complex, multifactorial. So yes, improvement in precision testing will help, but that alone won't be the answer without improved team performance and without other supports. Our next question comes from the web. Um, this person did not identify themselves, but they want to know more about uh, nurses as part of the team, especially in the hospital, since they are the first to recognize new and changes in symptoms. Thank you for that question. Yes, and uh, again, I want to emphasize that one of the very important messages of this report, which I think is different than both the public and the professions have thought of diagnosis, is his emphasis on diagnosis as a team process. And nurses are absolutely critical to that, particularly in a hospital setting. Nurses spend far more time with patients than other members of the team. So nurse observation, nurse input, and the creating the culture that invites that input and treats nurses as equal members of the team is an incredibly important part of making progress. We also need to focus on nursing education as we need to focus on physician education. So nurses are also both educated and empowered to know how to participate in the team process, understand the issues of critical thinking and, and cognitive errors in the same way. So it's a very important cultural issue, very important team issue, and a very important education issue, and nurses are absolutely central to it. Our next question comes from Neil Versal. He asks, why not recommend that reporting be mandatory? Uh, the committee really looked seriously at whether uh, reporting should be mandatory uh, and, and came to the conclusion that because of three factors, uh, the time was not right for that. Um, first of all, 
there is and there has been until our report no agreed upon definition of diagnostic error. Second, there is a lack of data about diagnostic error. And third, there lack of measurement. And so with the, the lack of three things, uh, definition, data, and measurement, it's very difficult to then understand what could be reported and what actions could be taken on that reporting. Instead, at least in the interim, what we should depend upon is the intrinsic motivation of professionals, which is in fact the case, to improve quality and safety. We've seen that over the last 15 years as hospitals, systems, and others have addressed issues of, of, of quality and safety, and we believe that this is the way to go at this stage. Our next question comes from Dr. Lawrence Weed. He asks, what about the role of diagnosis decision support computer systems for helping physicians be made aware of what else might be going on? Almost every physician is using electronic medical records these days in almost every hospital, and the electronic medical record has improved diagnosis in hundreds of ways. Uh, one of them is by making available resources that physicians can access in regard to medical knowledge and decision support resources that can help in creating a differential diagnosis. And the committee, I think, would like to see more of those things used to improve diagnosis, although we have much to learn about how to better integrate decision support and health IT in general into healthcare provisions. If I could just add to that, Mark, some of those same um, sort of reminder systems and differential diagnosis that comes up when you enter patient material, some of our recommendations about things that need to happen with the electronic health records to get more user friendly so that they can integrate more machine learning, really, and give you cues and use these kinds of decision support systems. Many of those same organizations that create those um, uh, apps for doctors also have apps for consumers. So I just wanted to mention that there are symptom checkers out there that can help a patient think through what are the things you want to ask your doctor about when you're going and can make you a more active and effective partner in that process. And our next question is from a gentleman who identified himself as David and he's a patient who has had a diagnostic error and he said that um, with the age of great technology, how do you see the use of new technology going forward to help patients as well as physicians? If you think about how diagnosis has improved over the last 50 years, it's not really because we're better thinkers. It's not because our systems are, are simpler or more effective. It's because of the many advances in technology. So technology has been the way that diagnosis has improved over the past years, and I think will be the leading way that it improves going forward. What this report adds to that is the possibility that we can improve even faster or more effectively by thinking about our healthcare systems and how we function in it cognitively. Our next question comes from Kevin O'Reilly. He's a senior editor at CAP Today. He wants to know, what do you see as the role for pathology and laboratory medicine professionals in helping to identify and reduce diagnostic errors? The committee spent a lot of time talking about this, and we had two excellent pathologists on the committee. Um, one of the things pathology has done, the profession has done over the last 10 years is to really look at their future as being more of a clinical support rather than simply providing the answer of a test. And where we see pathology and radiology going is getting much more involved earlier in the clinical process by helping the clinician, helping the, the primary care physician decide which tests to order, how to interpret those tests, and what those tests have meaning with regard to treatment. I just add to that too, the important educational component to that and coming back to learning about working in a team and having that be part of the explicit training process and one of the goals of the training process for uh, uh, physicians and for nurses and for specialists is to learn how to work in a team and learn how to use uh, the expertise of the other team members. And the payment system should be supportive of the collaboration between the physician who's directly caring for the patient and pathologists, radiologists, and other uh, clinicians who provide that kind of supportive activity. The payment system needs to recognize that collaboration. 
And we are at the top of the hour, so I'm just going to ask one more question. Uh, and I apologize for those who did type in questions. We received many of them today. Can you talk a little bit about, um, and this is this question is from Timothy Garrity. He talked about how the committee addressed the problem of overdiagnosis and its impact on uh, patient safety. Um, we did discuss the um, uh, other side of the coin, if you will, the problem of um, overdiagnosis and um, overtesting, which uh, John mentioned the parallel with the Choosing Wisely campaign, which um, uses professional expertise from specialty societies to educate patients about potential overuse of healthcare uh, uh, testing and interventions of various sorts. So the same thing could happen with overdiagnosis. The, the really important um, point here is that um, Overdiagnosis is another way of communicating the wrong message to the patient. So in some ways, it's also a misdiagnosis of saying um, if, uh, if a person um, has, a medical, is, has a medical condition and you've um, misstated what it is that's causing that condition, then the reassurance to the patient that they don't have a medical condition can be just as important in this explanatory process that we talked about in our report. So uh, the whole system, the team, um, uh, and the professionals need to be as effective as communicating with patients about where they may not have a diagnosis as when they do. Okay, thank you. With that, that concludes today's briefing. Again, want to remind you that you can get the full report, the video that you saw, as well as other resources, materials at nas.edu forward slash improving diagnosis. Thank you.